Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the International Cannabis Policy Conference. And here we have a special lecture, an extraordinary lecture uh, for opioid use disorder withdrawal. It's done by Philip Lucas. Uh, I want to introduce myself very shortly, but we have not so much time. Uh, my name is Kurt Blas. I'm a medical doctor here in Vienna. I'm working in the field of cannabis medicine at about 25 years. I began this medicine together with Franjo Grotenhermen in the late 90s, and we activated the IACM group. And now the IACM group has been very grown, very grown. Wonderful. You're also in the board. Yes, Ilya. Okay, I want only to say I have a praxis here in Vienna, and we also have an association, the Arbeitsgemeinschaft Cannabis as Medicine. I'm the leader of this association. And in my practice, it's very interesting. I work as a general practitioner. We also have a lot of medical patients. They come for cannabis. About, I think about 500 new patients every year. Over the year, we have about 1,500 patients. They come for control examination. And last week, I looked for our prescriptions. We make prescriptions for patients. They are not living here in Vienna. They're living in the rest of, of the area of Austria. And we are making about 2,500 prescriptions every year. A lot of work, a lot of work. That only is to say. OK, I only also want to introduce Dr. Ilya Resnik. He's a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's the chief physician and senior advisor at Medical Institute for Forensic and Diagnostic Neuropsychiatry in the Marena Center, Diagnostic Center, in Patiam, in Israel. Uh, we hold him in high regards. Uh, he's a very well-known researcher and I say visionary teacher in cannabis medicine. And he presents his medical papers all over Europe. I see him in Germany, I see him in Italy, I see him in Switzerland, I see him all over Europe. And every year I see him here in Austria at the Congress of Cultiva. Okay, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Gurt, for such generous presentation. It is very important to me that uh, you are here as a chairman of Austrian Medical Cannabis Association because I suppose it's uh, Austrian being a, 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 a Go, so have su such position between East and West, in, just in the middle of the Europe, uh, uh, conduct such conference in conjunction with the UN uh, meeting for control of narcotic drugs. Unfortunately, uh, they decided not to decide. They decided to postpone the uh, recommendation to UN uh, how to, to continue, continue to classify cannabis and cannabis-based products uh, being uh, dangerous, being uh, useful for medicine or not useful for medicine, uh, etc. We are we are still waiting, and I hope that you and uh, Austrian physicians and uh, all public is here will come with some uh, declaration. I hope that organizing committee of this conference will publish. Uh, the common declaration that coming from our uh, meeting to UN, to CND, to regulatory bodies of all the countries, uh, members of UN, uh, seeing our um, position, uh, how the uh, cannabis should be regulated uh, for medical research purposes and uh, for sustainable de development in the future. 
saying, uh, saying uh, few words about the cannabis for in the scope of uh, opiate crisis, uh, I should say that opiate crisis uh, is a huge problem, M major, maybe is a major health public health care problem, one of the major public health care problems in North America, in, particularly in the United States, lesser Canada, and lesser other countries. In Israel, we have the same, uh, almost the same policy for use opiate narcotic drugs for uh, treatment of pain, for treatment of chronic pain, acute pain, uh, but we uh, do not have such uh, larger uh, uh, negative outcomes of uh, such waste uh, uh, waste uh, prescription of uh, opiate drugs for different reasons. Uh, so our policy is more balanced than in in uh, United States, but we also have a lot of patients that uh, became to be addicted, but just heterogenically. Heterogenically, it means by us, by physicians. So we need to learn how we could uh, avoid this harm, how we should use uh, opiates wisely, and probably, probably, just thanks to coming uh, cannabis and cannabinoid-based medicine to our practice, we probably should try to change our practice to learn more uh, about the uh, more safe uh, me uh, methods, how it could be done using cannabis as a very, very uh, important material for uh, such patients. Just, I would like to say two words about the cannabis uh, because it's my last presentation of this conference and I would like to utilize it. I do not present uh, any kind of uh, 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 PowerPoint presentation. How I see, uh, what is my vision for cannabis? In previous lecture, uh, Philip uh, mentioned that Cannabis is a medicine or something almost as a medicine. Our vision, and uh, I'm here as a representative of our uh, uh, association, uh, just Kurt mentioned it, uh, International Association of Cannabinoid Medicine. We are looking for the cannabis and cannabis-based medicine. We are looking for the cannabis not as a medicine. I suppose the plant is not medicine. It was never medicine and will never will be medicine. The plant has a lot of uh, features, physiological features, uh, botanical features, and many, many others. Chemicals, chemovars, et cetera, et cetera. Cannabis is much more than medicine, much more than medicine. So to use cannabis wisely in our everyday practice is so important to me. It's changed my, completely changed my career when I, I was a co convenient psychiatrist and uh, with specialization of neuropsychiatry and brain dysfunction. When I had cannabis uh, in my, uh, in my uh, practice, it's changed it completely because I try to understand what is the uh, methods, how, to, how we can use cannabis and cannabinoid-based medicine. So for me, it is not a medicine. And attempts to make uh, from cannabis medicine, I suppose, um, very, very preliminary, and uh, this is one of the reasons that we do not have a reliable uh, full flower effect from the uh, cannabinoid-based medicine, and, and I hope it will be improved, but probably we will never have its medicine because it's not one single molecular method. The, uh, the, uh, just the sample of the marinol that is THC synthesized in the early 70s until now has no uh, usage uh, in the practice, saying, saying us that single molecules, even coming from uh, uh, THC and uh, working for endocannabinoid system, pro probably this uh, direction is uh, not right. So synthesized cannabinoids are existed. Uh, the uh, usage in medicine is very, uh, very limited. So this is why we need to use we need to use cannabis, we need to learn cannabis, this plant, how to use it wisely for our everyday practice. In this, in this uh, scope, I would like to, uh, to uh, say that probably for 
uh, this problem of opioid use uh, for patients with chronic pain disorders, for acute pain, we need to look better for cannabis as a first line option because unfortunately, even in the today presentation, uh, Pavel Kubo said that the Europeans decided, European Medicinal Agency decided that cannabis could be considered as a, a, a reliable me medicine, but after all uh, measures and after all um, uh, con con uh, all uh, uh, conclusive research will be done. Our patients do not have su such time. So as soon as we have cannabis available on the legal matter here in, I in Israel, in Canada, in Austria, in many other countries, because majority countries are legalized cannabis for medical purposes. We just need to utilize it wisely. I've, I visited Uruguay uh, in the January. You see, they legalized cannabis for all purposes, including medical purposes. How many medical, uh, medical cannabis treated patients you have in Uruguay? No, almost anyone, almost anyone. Because why? Because their doctors never prescribed it. They have no any kind of, any kind of information how to use it. And uh, unfortunately for our conference, we have only 25 Uruguayan uh, doctors there saying that doctors just need to be much better educated, but they need to be forced to educate themselves. So please be uh, generous to your, patient, to your doctors. Uh, try to understand they, they never had any kind of uh, spe specific training in this area. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to provide this uh, place to my friend Philip from Tilray. He will share with us uh, the data from the latest research. Uh, thanks God we have uh, companies that are ready to invest time and money to such kind of research. We need such kind of research because they are coming from the practice. I do not believe to uh, so-called evidence-based medicine. I just do not believe. For the many years, I was a researcher, clinical researcher. I made a lot of clinical research and randomized controlled trials. I don't believe them because of many, many different reasons. I don't want to point it now, but I believe to observational trials, naturalistic observational trials, uh, I believe to the data coming from the patients and uh, collected wisely, uh, scrupulously. I, I believe in this because this is a real world. And I hope that this direction that uh, Tilray support will uh, provide us more serious data and probably will change a practice uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Thank you, Philippe. I will give you a place. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I tend to wander around when I'm talking, so without a mic, I might, I'm might. i gonna invite the people at the back to move up a little bit, because we're also gonna finish today with a, a broad discussion where we're gonna bring up these two great doctors as well to be able to take questions on uh, cannabis and opioids. So without a floor mic, it'll be easier if you guys gather up a little bit, and plus, it's much nicer when we're closer together, right? Even after a long day. So my name is Philippe Lucas. I'm a graduate researcher with the Canadian Institute of Substance Use Research. That's my academic affiliation, please. I'm also um, the, uh, uh, the uh, global uh, uh, vice president of global patient research and access at Tilray. So oftentimes people ask me why I started researching cannabis and opioids or cannabis substitution effect, as it's otherwise called. That's the phenomenon where patients and recreational users both consciously and sometimes unconsciously uh, switch up cannabis for the use of other drugs. And oftentimes those are more dangerous drugs like prescription opioids or benzodiazepines. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes we see substitution for tobacco and sometimes for illicit substances as well like uh, uh, cocaine and, uh, and other illicit substances. And <clears throat> The reason I got involved in this is that when I started uh, as a patient in, in 1995, I ended up opening up a medical cannabis dispensary in 1999. And at the time in 1999, we were still hearing that cannabis was a gateway drug. And I had patients initially in Canada, the early adopters of medical cannabis were patients suffering from HIV AIDS and hepatitis C. And most of them had gotten HIV AIDS or hepatitis C through injection drug use. And they would come into my clinic 
And um, I would say, so you've got a prescription for HIV AIDS or for Hep C, they say yes, we have a prescription. But you know, I don't really use it for the side effects or to treat those conditions. I use it because when I eat a cannabis cookie, I don't feel like going out and getting heroin. Or I use it because when I smoke a joint, I don't feel like smoking crystal meth. And so what these patients were telling me flew in the face of what our governments and our education you know, facilities were telling me, which was cannabis was a gateway drug, that you started with cannabis, then you graduated to cocaine and heroin, et cetera. And what I could see and hear from these patients is at least for this group, instead of being a gateway drug to addiction, it was an exit drug to addiction. They found that they didn't need these harder drugs of abuse when they were using cannabis. And that got me really interested in gathering that data. So for the last 10 or 15 years, I've really been researching cannabis substitution effect en masse. And <clears throat> as the opioid crisis has grown, my research is more and more focused on opioids because that's where the biggest public health impacts are. But I'm really interested in this research because it has significant public health impacts. It says that we have an opioid crisis, but we also have solutions to the opioid crisis. And I'm the last person to say that cannabis will end the opioid crisis, but I think it's one tool that we can implement along with supervised consumption sites and heroin maintenance programs that we need to be innovative if we're gonna stop this crisis, which is really a crisis of prohibition more than it is a crisis of opioids or any specific drug. So to give to you guys who may not be from North America a sense of how bad things have gotten in North America right now, um, the biggest cause of accidental death right now for adults 18 to 35 in North America is opioid overdose deaths. So when I was growing up, if you were an 18-year-old, your biggest chance of death was drinking and driving. You drink and drive, you get in an accident. But right now, opioid overdose deaths is the biggest risk for kids 18 and, and adults 18 to 35. It's, it's outflanking all other risks by a long shot. And it's gotten so bad in British Columbia, where I'm from, which have the highest rates of HIV AIDS and of Hep C for a while in the Western world, because Vancouver's a port town and it's a, a through way for, for heroin use. It's gotten so bad there that the life expectancy in British Columbia has gone down overall in the last year as a result of the opioid overdose deaths that are happening. So this year, we're expected to live less long than last year because of the skew of opioid overdose deaths. So just to give you guys a sense of how bad things are getting in North America. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tilray Research Program, but I've talked about it a few times today, so we won't uh, go over it too much. I'll talk about medical cannabis and the treatment of pain and mental health. And we'll talk about substitution for op opioids, alcohol, and other substances. I'm going to show a short movie, uh, which is a patient video of one of our patients. Because as someone who's worked with patients and who started out as a patient, I just want to point out, almost everything we know about medical cannabis, we know because patients have told us. And I do research to try and catch up and capture what patients tell us, but we wouldn't know that cannabis was useful for pediatric epilepsy because, unless patients had told us it was. We've done the research to follow it up, and yes, now we have publications, but we only know it because patients have told us. Same with MS, same with the treatment of, uh, of hep C and other conditions. We know because patients tell us. So for me, as a long-term patient advocate, uh, it really starts and ends with the patient's story. So today I'll end with a patient's story. So I mentioned uh, before that uh, Tilray products are available in 12 countries on five continents now. We're, uh, uh, our headquarters where I work out of is in Nanaimo, British Columbia, but we have production facilities in Ontario. And we also have a uh, production facility in Portugal. This is a quick look at our production facility in British Columbia. It's the first GMP certified medical cannabis production facility in North America. We've got 67 different strains there right now. We've got over 300 full-time employees. And I did a presentation earlier about uh, the social, uh, social sustainability of the cannabis industry. We won the Chamber of Commerce Award. We were awarded the Chamber of Commerce Award for the best employer in the region because we provide good jobs with uh, full benefits and even stock options to all of our staff that come on board. So in this facility, we have about 31 cultivation rooms. We grow between 20 and 40,000 plants at any given time. Very high THC plants, some as high as 30% THC and very high CBD plants as well. Uh, this is a quick look at our production facility in Portugal. It's still being built out, so this is a temporary greenhouse we were using this summer. These plants were about nine feet high. I've never seen plants that big in 20 years of doing this. Portugal's a very good place 
to grow medical cannabis. We're very excited. This facility will be GMP certified and all of the Tilray cannabis products coming out in Europe will be produced out of Portugal uh, starting in 2019. Um, this is a quick look at the Tilray different cannabis products. So we've got whole flower products, capsules, and then full spectrum oil. And the one thing that I want to mention here is that we like patients, physicians, and pharmacists to know exactly what they're working with. And so every number here that you see, the first number indicates the THC level of the plant. The second number indicates the CBD level of the product. So in this case, when we're talking about flower product, this is 18% THC, 0% CBD. Uh, we've got a 10-10 here, which is what we call a balanced product. Um, with our capsules, this is five milligrams of THC, or five milligrams of THC and 20 milligrams of CBD per capsule. And then when it comes to extracts, it's per milliliter. And so when you look at this product, two by 100, that's two milligrams of THC and 100 milligrams of CBD per milliliter. So very, very high CBD products available uh, through Tilray as well, largely for our pediatric patients. Um, we're very proud of having a relationship with Sandoz. We're one of the only uh, pharmacy, or, uh, cannabis companies in the, anywhere in the world that's developed a, a, a relationship with a traditional pharmaceutical company. Sandoz is the generic arm of Novartis, which is based out of Switzerland. Um, and uh, it's been great to have the Sandoz logo on all of our non-flower products. It gives physicians more confidence. It gives uh, patients and pharmacists more confidence that these are medical grade cannabis products. And we're involved in a number of clinical trials, um, ranging from uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in Australia, uh, pediatric epilepsy, post-traumatic stress disorder at the University of British Columbia, uh, COPD we did at McGill University. These two tri uh, this trial is done. Essential tremors at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, cannabis and driving study just finished at the uh, University of Sydney. The results are going to be published soon. And then we're going to be announcing uh, clinical trials in cancer, HIV, AIDS, anxiety, and alcoholism in the coming weeks. Um, I'm in charge of uh, Tilray's observational strategy. I'm an active medical cannabis researcher, both at Tilray and with the Canadian Institute of Substance Use Research. I won't go into too many details here, but I do want to tell you that today, most of my presentation will focus on the results from uh, its preliminary data from the Tilray Observational Patient Study. That's the largest longitudinal prospect of tracking of medical cannabis patients to take place in Canada so far. We are tracking 2,100 patients at 21 medical sites across five provinces, and we're tracking those patients for a 12-month period of time uh, to look at the impact of medical cannabis on quality of life and prescription drug use. So really significant amount of data that we're gathering there. Uh, I also want to mention this one because this is an opioid panel. There's some evidence that suggests that cannabis can improve the success rate of methadone and suboxone treatment. And so we're doing a study right now comparing 250 patients who are starting methadone and suboxone treatment without med medical cannabis, and we're comparing them to 250 patients who are starting methadone and suboxone for the first six months with medical cannabis. We're looking at the uh, uh, withdrawal rates that they're having, as well as adherence to treatment uh, with biological confirmation through urine tests of either cannabis use or cannabis abstinence. So this could be very revealing because if it turns out that cannabis can help people stick to methadone suboxone treatment, it could be part of a, a complete course of care that can improve and save lives ultimately for those patients that have an opioid use disorder. So now I'm gonna share some of the data from the Tilray Observational Patient Study. So this is a study that's a very simple design in many ways. Um, it's looking at quality of life, and we're using the World Health Organization Quality of Life short form for that. It's one of the most validated quality, quality of life instruments out there. We're using a very detailed cannabis use survey that tracks cannabis use down to the point in grams per day. Uh, so frequency, how people are using it, methods of ingestion, whether they're smoking, vaporizing, using extracts, using capsules, very detailed cannabis use survey. And then we've got a prescription drug questionnaire. All of the data is gathered on an iPad via RedCap. And the neat thing about the prescription drug questionnaire is it's filled out by the physician, not the patient, at each visit. So there's no recall bias, because I don't know about you guys, but if someone asked me what prescription drugs I used three weeks ago or three months ago, I can tell you it's like the blue one and I use twice a day. You know, like it's, I don't get into a lot of detail, and a lot of patients don't know what they're using. 
But when you ask physicians to fill out prescription drug data, they get it down to the milligram per day, and that's what we were trying to get to. So with this study, we were, um, as I mentioned, it's 21 participating clinics uh, right now, and we did data gathering at baseline when the patient first talks to the doctor about medical cannabis use, and then we do data gathering at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months, and the data I'm gonna share with you guys today is from the first 573 patients that have done at least one follow-up visit uh, since starting the study. And I just wanna say that, you know, Tilray takes care with our conflict of interest. Um, we don't do the data gathering. The physicians and clinics do all the data gathering here. We don't do the evaluation of that data. So the analysis was conducted by the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences, otherwise known as CHAOS at UBC. And here's what we learned. So 55% of the respondents in this study were women. Now this is really significant because in 15 years of doing medical cannabis research, I've never done a single study where we had more women than men. Men are typically using medical cannabis in Europe and Canada and the US and Australia at a rate of two to one compared to women. And there's only one reason for that. Men are more criminogenic. And that means that we're more likely to break the law. So when it comes to these novel treatments using something like cannabis, we're early adopters. And so men are typically more, you know, more ready to take on cannabis as medicine than women are. But the really exciting thing is seeing that gender balance grow over the last few years. And there's a good reason why we're seeing more women come to medical cannabis. There's conditions with a higher prevalence in women, like lupus, MS, fibromyalgia, uh, migraines, depression, and anxiety that aren't treated well by traditional pharmaceuticals, but do respond well to medical cannabis. And more and more women are finding out that medical cannabis is useful in those treatment modalities. And so I think that's one of the reasons we're starting to see gender balance uh, amongst this. Now what we see is that this is also a well-educated population, better educated than the general population. And there's no coincidence there, we got a lot of smart women turning to medical cannabis and concerning its use. I haven't brought up any income data, but you typically see uh, an interesting range when it comes to income for medical cannabis patients, more low-income patients than the general population, and more high-income as well. So, uh, and there's, there's less in the middle. So typically, cannabis patients are better educated, um, a little bit higher income than the general population, and often better looking. So that's, a, that's subjective, but I stand by it, okay? So that's a subjective analysis. Uh, the average age of uh, these patients is 49 years old, and 70% of respondents were 40 years or over. I think that really breaks down some of the stereotype of who's using medical cannabis around the world. There's still a sense that it's 20-year-old guys doing bong hits in a basement, getting a doctor to sign a script for them, but in 20 years of working with medical cannabis patients, what I typically see are middle-aged individuals who've had uh, treatment failure using traditional treatment and who are looking for alternatives to uh, traditional treatment. So this is really interesting that, that it's such a, a, a much older population than you might expect. And um, I always ask the same two questions when I do this kind of study. What's your primary condition? And you only get to check one box in that question. So what's the main reason you talk to your doctor about using medical cannabis? And then I ask patients, what are your primary symptoms? And there you get to check multiple boxes. So because we were recruiting at a lot of uh, clinics that specialize in pain, you see a preponderance of pain patients here at 66%. But when I go to the next slide at primary symptoms, you see the breakout a little bit more. And what you see is chronic pain is still cited by almost 80% of patients. But that's closely followed by insomnia, anxiety, stress, depression, and then headache again. So six out of 10 of the first conditions are either pain or mental health. And if you're involved in healthcare at all, you'll know that pain and mental health are often comorbidities, that patients with long-term pain conditions sometimes develop mental health conditions like stress, anxiety, depression as a comorbidity, and sometimes the reverse is true too, that patients with long-term mental health conditions sometimes develop chronic pain as a comorbidity. We also see a lot of appetite loss and nausea, sometimes to do with chemotherapy-induced uh, nausea associated with cancer treatment, but also um, side effects of HIV AIDS and hep C treatment. 
We see spasms like Parkinsonian uh, conditions, MS, epilepsy, and then GI issues like Crohn's, colitis, IBS, IBD. These are all very common reasons why patients are using medical cannabis in Canada, but ultimately pain and mental health account for about 80% of the uh, patients using uh, medical cannabis. <coughs> And in terms of the average use per week for people who are using flour, well, the average use per day is 1.27 grams per day. And that's very consistent with research that's been done in Europe, in Holland, in Australia, in Canada, and the US that suggests that most medical cannabis patients use between 0.5 and 1.5 grams per day. Uh, and most patients are using it two times or less per day. Uh, so repeated use at about 1.27 grams per day. Doctors always used to ask me, when patients start using medical cannabis, do they increase their rate? Do they develop a tolerance for it? And my experience is that they don't, and the data certainly fills, uh, 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 supports that as well. So here we've got a line of non-naive cannabis patients. So they're experienced cannabis patients, but they just started using it by prescription using Tilray products on month zero. And then you've got naive patients, so they're brand new to medical cannabis. They didn't, they didn't use it at month zero. They only started using it at month one because they weren't using it when they started and saw their doctor. Um, and you see that the rates of use didn't really increase between baseline and six months. And the amazing thing about medical cannabis is that patients develop a tolerance to the side effects. They develop a tolerance even to impairment. They develop a tolerance to the dry mouth, to the red eyes, to the munchies, but they tend not to develop a tolerance to the therapeutic effects. And so that what's, that's what makes it not only such a safe treatment, but an effective treatment, because you don't have to keep increasing the dose as you often do with prescription opioids or other medications. When patients find that right dosage window, they tend to stick to it over time. And um, here we're looking at primary method and uh, uh, primary method of use, and then preferred type of cannabis. Once again, this is very different than the past research I've done over the past 15 years. It's the first study I've ever done where oral ingestion beaded out inhalation in terms of primary method of use. For 15 years, I was watching at first smoking was dominant, vaporization was used by maybe 10% of patients about 15 years ago. Then vaporization became the dominant method of ingestion, smoking slipped to the back, but now oral ingestion is having its time. More and more patients are looking to use orally, and there's a couple of reasons for that. It's very discreet, so when you're using it during the day, about 70% of patients at Tilray are still working. So they can't vaporize or smoke at work, so they, but they can take an oil or a capsule, and they use high CBD products during the day, and then higher THC products at night when they get home. And so oral ingestion is tied directly to the, the rate of high CBD use. This is the first study that I've done where high CBD beats out all the high THC products when you add them together. And so this really highlights a significant shift away from the smoked ingestion of high THC products. Whether it's Canada or Holland or the US, if I was talking about medical cannabis 10 years ago, I'd be talking about smoked THC. That's it, that's really what we're talking about, except for a minority of folks uh, using vaporization. Now when we talk about medical cannabis, in many ways, we're talking about oral ingestion of CBD products. I wanna be clear, THC is an incredibly useful therapeutic agent. I don't want us to dismiss it, and there's been too much move to dismiss it from pharmacists and physicians who suddenly think we have CBD, we don't need THC anymore. I completely disagree with that. THC is still where most of the research has been done. It's still where most of the therapeutic efficacy can be found. But I'm really pleased to see oral ingestion of high CBD coming into the fore because it means that patients can use without worrying about impairment. They can go to work, they can drive without worrying about impairment. Uh, so now we'll talk about substitution effect and talk about opioids. So um, this is uh, looking at the, uh, the patients in percentage of patients who are using these different types of drugs at baseline in blue, and then one month, three months, and six months in orange. So whether it's opioid or non-opioid pain medications, antidepressants, anti-seizure drugs, benzodiazepines, or sleep aid and muscle relaxants, what you see is a statistically significant reduction in the use of all of these medications from baseline to six months, uh, in the number of patients who are using these. And when you look at opioids uh, independently, you see that at baseline, 32% of patients reported opioid use, and by six months, that was down to 13.6% of patients. 
so that's a, uh, that's a significant reduction. And the amazing thing is, it didn't matter whether you were cannabis naive or non-naive, we still saw the stepwise significant reduction from one study uh, from uh, month zero to month one to month three to month six, the steady decline in the use of opioids uh, between all those, uh, uh, all those uh, uh, time periods at, at a statistically significant rate. Now, the, this decline was so significant that the odds ratio of using opioids at six months compared to baseline is 0 0.12 compared to baseline. So such a significant reduction in opioid use and the risk of using opioids. And the actual opioid usage per day was really reduced as well. So the way that we did this is we used something called the morphine milligram equivalency. And that, that allows you to compare a very low grade opioid like codeine to a high grade opioid like Oxycontin and methadone. And it assigns different values to each. So when we assign the values to all of the individual medications that our patients were using, what we found is that the average use was 187 milligrams per day at baseline. And by six months, that had reduced to 48 milligrams per day, which is a 74% reduction in opioid use uh, by the milligram per day. It's hard to look at data like this without thinking that cannabis is actually playing a role in the opioid overdose crisis. But you know, the most amazing thing about this data is that these doctors weren't deliberately tapering these patients off opioids. Most of this substitution is happening on an ad hoc basis. And so can you imagine if we had a deliberate strategy of doctors tapering patients off opioids, the impact that we could have from a public health point of view? Earlier in the year, I published a, a, a study, well, it wasn't a study, it was kind of a, a commentary called Rationale for Cannabis-Based Interventions in the Opioid Overdose Crisis. It was published in Harm Reduction Journal, and it became one of the most popular, one of the most downloaded papers of, the, of that journal's history because we're in the middle of the opioid crisis. So I think, and, and basically it was a compendium, a gathering of all of the evidence of how cannabis can impact the opioid crisis. And in it, I make three recommendations, and one of them was touched on today. One of the recommendations that I make is that um, we should now, our, our treatment guidelines should at least put cannabis on par, if not ahead of opioids. Knowing what we know today, we need to modernize treatment guidelines. There's no reason why a doctor should take a patient through opioid overdose, or, or through opioid medications, when you've got some potential treatment options like cannabis that are safer and more effective, ultimately. So I think that we need to look at those treatment guidelines, as was suggested, and really adjust those treatment guidelines accordingly. Um, so on top of that, we see reductions in opioid use, but you also see statistically significant improvements in quality of life in all four domains of quality of life, uh, with the biggest changes being seen in physical health and psychological health. So very simple math, patients have a, a chronic condition, they introduce medical cannabis in the course of care, they use fewer pharmaceuticals, they get improvements in quality of life. It's a very simple study and very simple to, to look at. And we're not the only ones who have found that cannabis can have reductions in opioid overdoses. Um, in uh, Back Huber and all in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that there was a 25% reduction in opioid overdose deaths in medical cannabis states compared to those neighboring states that did not have medical cannabis programs in place. Uh, more recently, when in Hockenberry saw a 6% reduction in opioid uh, prescribing, and then Socius and all, my colleagues in Vancouver, found that cannabis use was associated, at, or daily or more cannabis use, so even more so than occasional cannabis use, was associated with a 21% greater odds of retention in methadone or suboxone treatment. So really exciting to see other research coming and supporting this as well. I just want to close today by showing you guys a quick movie of our patient Maria, and then we look forward to taking some questions from you. One minute. One minute. Yeah. No problem, this is a very short movie. This is part of 300 morphine tablets per month. A few bottles of nortriptyline. Try and break the chronic sleep pattern. All of these combined uh, have about 23 side effects to them. It's a part-time job managing chronic pain. The other part-time job is managing the side effects of this stuff. I, I, I want my life back. I want to have my quality of life returned. There is 
is no, no place that it's not painful. A, a lot of things were affected by, by the injury. I had to go through a grieving process of um, really dealing with the emotional impact. It was very, very hard. In, in the beginning of taking morphine, the side effects weren't quite so bad. It, it seemed to get worse. Narcotics was altering my reality. It was altering everything about me. I really had to put myself through a process of reevaluating my own values when it comes to cannabis. For me, it, it was then agreeing with my doctors who had made the suggestion before I was ready to try this. And then to actually see what happened when we tried it on four different occasions. Um, to see actually small amounts kill the pain, stop the rain outs, and I'm not high, I'm not out there, I've got no side effects, and I have four hours where I have no pain. Life has returned to somewhat normal. By day three, my body actually felt like mine. I had no more cramps in my legs. Um, I wasn't feeling unwell, I was actually feeling well. By day eight, um, I was completely off morphine. What's changed is my mind is clear. There's no overlay, that fog of morphine. I can multitask like I used to. I'm back able to be really clear in conversations, not nauseated, um, not indigestion, not feeling unwell. All of that's dissipated, so I'm back to what you would call myself. My quality of life was destroyed, and now I have it back. <laughs> Maria and my family have become quite close over the years, and she's teaching my nine-year-old daughter how to fish, and I'm happy to say they've had more success than that in their recent uh, fishing excursions. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. I understand that Dr. Ethan Russo is joining us, so we're going to uh, do a quick introduction. He's going to be joining us online, and then he's going to take part in the discussion and also the questions that we're taking. So barring any technical issues, we're going to try and loop him in. Go ahead. I have the great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Ethan Russo. Sorry. No uh, I'm, I'm sure you all know him. He is a very well uh, researcher all over the world. Uh, I say uh, he's, uh, he's the best uh, cannabinoid researcher I ever had seen. Uh, and uh, I hope we will see him now and we can talk with him now. Only some minutes, yes? You are connecting. Testing, oh, testing. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, well, I'm looking at the ceiling in your room. Um, anyway, I'm happy to join you. I wish uh, I could be there in person. Um, anyway, I, this is a very critical topic at this time. Uh, the opioid crisis is perhaps its worst in the United States. In 2017, 72,000 people died of opioid overdoses. So this is a critical public health uh, disaster which needs addressing. And as we've heard uh, in prior talks, cannabis seems to be part of the solution uh, as an exit drug or exit strategy. Now, this is actually not a new concept. The idea of opioid sparing was first described by physicians in Europe and North America in the 19th century. Unfortunately, in medicine, we tend to forget things like this, particularly since we've been dealing with, with seven decades of prohibition, which has set us back greatly in the research and the application of cannabis-based medicines that could have taken place. Um, in addition to the data that uh, Philippe presented, we have similar data now from various survey and observational studies, particularly in Israel where the same kind of thing has been seen. Basically, when patients gain access to cannabis over the course of three months, we see an overall 40% reduction in opioid use, as well as similar figures for other adjunctive medicines, such as benzodiazepines. Um, so that means some get off entirely. 
And uh, some remain stable, but don't escalate their dosing, as we often see in chronic pain. The other thing that we found out in the last year, due to a very important study by Krebs et al., is that chronic non-cancer pain does not respond well to current opioid therapy. At the end of a year, the Patients who were not receiving opioids actually were doing better with their pain and with markedly less side effects. So this is a practice that we need to avoid in the future and confine opioid use to acute situations such as after bone fractures or postoperatively uh, and uh, to use with cancer pain where there still is a role. But even then, we know that 70% of patients with cancer um, have pain that often is severe by the end of their lives. Uh, and again, uh, it is apparent that cannabis has an important role there. There have been two phase two studies done with Sativex, the orimacosal um, uh, cannabis-based medicine with uh, THC and cannabidiol, as well, the, as well as other components that showed benefit in cancer pain. Some interesting things came from these studies in that it worked best with low or moderate doses. High doses produce more side effects, but not as much pain control. Um, additionally, in patients who use these long-term, um, the not only did the cannabis dosage not be increased over time, but the expected increase in opioid doses as the patients succumb to their cancer did not materialize. So this, in effect, is a type of opioid sparing as well. Um, so at this point, I've probably talked long enough and probably uh, should uh, open things up to questions. Uh, one other point with the uh, Sativex and cancer pain, there were subsequently three phase three studies, um, clinical trials. Um, interestingly, they did not read out overall. However, the American patients did show statistically significant improvements in pain control with side effects. In the rest of the world, the same improvement was not seen, but the patients outside of the U.S. were considerably more advanced in their disease process. Uh, this was known from worse Karnofsky scores uh, of their capabilities in daily living. So the point is that we should be using more cannabis and earlier in the course of these illnesses and trying to avoid the considerable morbidity and mortality attached to chronic opioid treatment. And with that, I'll stop, and uh, hopefully we can take questions from the floor. Thank you. Yeah, so now we've got time for questions, if anyone has any, for uh, Ethan or Dr. Blas or Ilya or, or myself. We're all four. Uh, shall I stand? I don't know. Yeah, right, yeah, sure. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I like the more intimate room. It's good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've heard uh, from you from earlier you talked about synthetic cannabinoids, and I, I have two questions really. And my question would be you said that the use of synthetic cannabinoids is, is limited, uh, and that you're more in range of the story of Philip Lucas with the full spectrum. And I was wondering does the full spectrum protect against the, the side effects of the synthetic cannabinoids? That, that would be my first question. And my second question would be, there's a lot of talk on um, full spectrum, but what is full spectrum? Uh, we're also conducting clinical research next year, and we, use, we say full spectrum is plant identical, we use plant profile. But what, what, what is full spectrum? Is that with all the terpenes and all the other cannabinoids, or do you change the THC level? to avoid THC side effects. So, so, yeah, what is it and what's best? I have my privilege to address this question to Aiden Russo because, mm -hmm. as you know, he's the best research in this area. He had a lot of pub pa published papers. Aiden, do you hear us? Yes, uh, sure. Let me address the question, uh, which is a good one. Um, full spectrum means as the plant provided. Uh, my strong bias is that this is almost always better. 
Uh, let's give a specific example. As you may uh, know, Epidiolex, a 97% pure CBD preparation, was recently approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for treatment of Dravet and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, severe forms of epilepsy. Um, however, the doses used uh, were commonly in the range of 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. We know from a recent meta-analysis uh, from Fabrizio Pamplona that it, using whole cannabis extracts, that similar results in efficacy have been obtained with about five milligrams per kilogram per day. So that would be cannabis extracts containing um, five milligrams per kilogram of CBD, but with additionally small amounts of THC, other cannabinoids, et cetera. Additionally, as you might imagine, there were many fewer side effects in the lower dose range, uh, mainly because of the lack of drug-drug interactions that are sometimes seen with extremely high doses of CBD, particularly in combination with benzodiazepines. So the same thing applies otherwise. And um, it is a situation where I really can't name you an indication that where um, cannabidiol, its efficacy would not be improved by the presence of other components, particularly even tiny amounts of THC. Uh, the two are quite complementary to one another. Um, and. Um, Again, my strong bias is in favor of whole plant extracts because of the entourage, the synergy between components. Synergy can consist of improved analgesic responses, but also reduced side effects. Uh, so this is a very important concept, and um, you lose some of that with single components. Yeah, I'm, I'm very like-minded uh, to Ethan uh, in, in that discussion as well. I think the data... Uh, proves itself out quite a bit. But I also want to point out that there's some challenges associated with that. So doctors and research organizations would prefer that we do clinical trials with single compounds so that there's no confounders. And so there's a constant battle when it comes to cannabis research about whether we should be studying single compounds that may be less effective but it's easier to identify an effect versus whole plant products where we have to explain why we need 100 chemicals and you know, in, in, in what the use of all those chemicals might be or the impact might be on the findings of THC CBD efficacy overall. So it, it is more challenging to study that. I think that time is on our side on this one though because in the last 15 years, we've seen two things happen, two trends in medicine that support whole plant medicine. The first one is personalized medicine approaches, which we're seeing more and more when it comes to cancer treatment and other treatments, which suggests to me that when patients say, this strain works for me and this one doesn't work for me, that that talks about and, and alludes to a personalized medicine approach. And the nice thing is, with thousands of different cannabis strains out there, there's probably the right strain for you if you've got a condition that can benefit from the use of cannabis. And therefore, that speaks a bit to per personalized medicine. And the other trend that's really happened is combination medicine therapies. And as someone who suffered from hepatitis C, I had failed out of interferon treatment many years ago initially. I was non-responsive to interferon, but then they came out with a combination medication of uh, protease, polymerase inhibitors, and I was successful under that treatment. So now we understand that if you track, uh, attack a condition using more than one uh, therapeutic agent that you can, you know, you can use an agent to reduce a viral load and another one to stop viral replication, uh, then you can have a more successful treatment. And so those trends, which are mean you're dealing with more complex medicines, but maybe more effective medicines, may be in our favor when it comes to looking at whole plant cannabis medicines as well. What about the side effects of the uh, synthetic cannabinoids? Uh, synthetic cannabinoids, I, I don't know that anyone's looked at adding, you know, terpenes or, or different minor cannabinoids to synthetic cannabinoids, so I wouldn't know about the side effects of that. Ethan, are you aware of any research that's been done on synthetic cannabinoids with the addition? Uh, yeah, my simple solution to that is don't use a synthetic <laughs> cannabinoid. It is. That's, that's um, no, generally quite, a good rule of thumb. I mean, seriously, uh, we're, we're looking at drugs here that, um, yeah. first of all, they were never designed for human administration. Yeah. We're often talking about drugs that are 100 times more potent than THC, 
which is a weak partial agonist. In comparison, these are full agonists of great potency. They have many off-target effects and definite toxicities, toxicities that we never see with any amount of cannabis itself. So, uh, you know, I hesitate to even call them um, synthetic cannabinoids uh, just because uh, guilt to cannabis accrues from the myriad problems that we see with these agents. They're overtly dangerous, and um, I don't know that uh, they could be mitigated uh, by use of cannabidiol or terpenoids. I, I think uh, prevention necessitates that uh, we do our best to properly educate people about their dangers. Part of the problem is because youth around the world um, are distrustful of the dangers they've heard about in relation to cannabis. They don't believe them in relation to synthetic cannabinoids either. But as uh, cannabis use is liberalized, uh, hopefully people wouldn't resort uh, to these dangerous alternatives. Yeah, I tend to agree. And it's not just the side effects in terms of physical side effects, which are well known and well documented now. Uh, psychological side effects like from Monobent, you know, causing suicidal ideation. When you start messing with their endogenous cannabinoid system with these full agonists, you never know what's going to come out the other end. Uh, these are core systems. The endogenous cannabinoid system is a core system. Our body regulates and uh, upregulates and downregulates so many of our different systems that when you use these full agonists like Ramonaban, suddenly you get these side effects like, yes! Patients did lose weight, we found out, and they wanted to kill themselves. So that's not so good, you know? So that's, that's one of the problems, is that it's not just the physical side effects, it's psychological side effects that come into play as well. I just would like to, to add something. Because we are speaking about syn uh, synthetic cannabinoids, uh, we have a big problem in psychiatry, because uh, many youngsters who have uh, no access to cannabis because uh, grass cannabis uh, is uh, very expensive, so they buy synthetic cannabinoids mixtures like Mr. Nice Guy, Spice, etc., that made by uh, uh, underground uh, laboratories. We practi practically, practically do not know what kind of THC isomers they use, in which proportions, and this is a high problem of psychiatry because we have a lot of uh, new or uh, new outcome of psychosis in such kind of usage. We do not have such uh, have such results from THC like Valinor, for example. We do not have such. Uh, so this is a different uh, pr strategy to produce produce, produce such mixtures. We need to put it in consideration that we could use Valinor very in the very synthetic THC, very in the very safe manner. Probably not so good for the marketing, but it is a quite safe medication. But and we should not use uh, synthetic mixtures uh, having different isomers of synthetic THC mixtures. So we need to differentiate these things in order to bring better safe uh, treatment for the patients. And, and as you suggested, this is a this is a prohibition related problem. It's not a cannabis problem. It's a prohibition related problem. I, I have to I have to make an addition concerning the synthetic cannabinoids that you meant. Uh, spicy and other narcotic drugs of synthetic cannabinoids. That, that is not uh, the uh, natural phytocannabinoids. It's not, uh, uh, you shouldn't speak about uh, uh, any isomers of tetrahydrocannabinol. That is chemically absolutely different compounds. So, uh, the, uh, but uh, the problem uh, uh, in the sense of pharmaceutical um, vision of uh, uh, cannabinoids themselves, uh, is uh, that probably uh, it might be uh, better to, um, uh, to synthesize analogs of uh, a terpenoid type of compounds that exist in a natural cannabis sativa uh, that might be even better uh, um, with respect to side effects. And then, what do you think about it, this suggestion? Uh... Again, my stance is the plant does it better. Um, the uh, cannabis genome is so plastic that uh, with proper time and attention, you can make the plant produce anything you'd want. Um, so we have the situation now of various companies 
trying to get uh, yeasts or E. coli uh, to grow cannabinoids. Uh, and maybe they can bring this up to scale and do it more cheaply. Uh, to me, uh, this isn't the proper way to do it. Um, the plant has shown incredible versatility, and we need to tap into that is my bias. We already know that these are very non-toxic compounds. The most toxic is THC, whose dangers have been vastly exaggerated. Um, and when properly administered as an extremely safe drug, particularly in conjunction with other components that mitigate its side effects. Um, so again, I was trained in standard pharmacology and new chemical entities, but I'm focusing my career at this point on uh, plant-derived uh, medicines. I've, I've got a question for you. Um, yeah, sure. So, question because we one need last, to... One last question. Okay, last question, please. Can I, can I? Okay. Ask so, no, you had one already. Yeah, yes, but there is more people okay. back there. Yeah, yeah. My, my question is that, uh, unfortunately, when using cannabis and using it as an adjunct medication, often the doctor is caught between two worlds where they often drug test and then fire the patient from their clinic because they quote unquote, failed a drug test for using cannabis. So I asked, and we've tried to work with the Medical Association, state medical boards, and they agree with the concept, but are afraid to take action because of the politics. So I just think you're a great group to ask, <coughs> what can we do to move forward to make sure that medical marijuana patients, cannabis using patients, uh, can use cannabis as an adjunct and not run afoul of the rules of their clinic? Well, it sounds like it's a doctor education, a physician education problem more than anything else. It's also in the also policy makers, in, in, in the medical boards of the medical chambers of the particular states, uh, medical associations, they are largely uh, uh, hypocritic and largely uh, ignorant of these issues. We need to insist to change uh, to uh, this, uh, because having medical cannabis in our armamentarium provides us better treatment for these patients. They should not be neglected and they should not be criminalized or uh, discriminated just because they use it as part of the treatment regimen. Uh, so we need to insist to change medical practice. This is what the major idea of uh, medical cannabis professional associations together with patients advocacy, we should have a doctor's advocacy that will do such uh, work and uh, lead such policy. But we need to uh, conclude this conference. Probably we could have only one particular question from this lady, uh, from the, please. Yeah, uh, well, wow, to conclude the conference. Um, <laughs> but I was curious about the opioid sparing effect with cannabis. And so is it that cannabis is somehow making opioids more effective? Is it that the cannabis are treating symptoms that the, or that the opioids are treating? And is it like a dose for dose? Like, do you take one dose of cannabis and one dose of opioids? Or is it more of a long-term program that you have to be part of? Peter, do you have some, some response? Sure. Um, this is a situation when uh, patients have access to cannabis, they largely figure out on their own um, how to slowly taper. Now, again, it is great if they do this in conjunction with a physician uh, who can suggest a slow tapering once uh, pain control is attained. But what we often find is that uh, if a patient is seen, they begin cannabis, some time goes by and often they've reduced this on their own. They can be used at the same time. They can be used on alternating doses. This seems to be less important. But uh, the key thing is, yes, um, there is an additive, if not synergistic, uh, effect on pain of cannabinoids with opioids. And addition, additionally to that, uh, cannabis treats um, withdrawal symptoms from opioids, whether it be nausea uh, or other autonomic problems. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, this setting, we don't have time to go into all the details, but um, we have abundant evidence at this point, both epidemiologically from a few randomized controlled trials and many observational uh, studies that uh, there's a great benefit in 
conjunction, um, having these drugs in conjunction, uh, that cannabinoids provide uh, better pain relief and allow gradual tapering and often discontinuation of opioids. And there is a critical public health need for this information to be better uh, known uh, so that physicians can uh, start practicing better medicine for these chronic pain patients. Yeah, as Ethan, Ethan says, there's a repotentiation also that happens with opioids. So if people have become been using opioids, even successfully and safely over a long period of time, when they go see their doctor again and say, it's not as effective as it used to be, can we boost my dose or boost my uh, potency of my opioid? Uh, or the frequency I'm using them, you can introduce cannabis to repotentiate those opioids as well. So that's another way that it can impact the opioid overdose crisis by never having patients keep walking down the line from very safe, you know, a temporary opioid use to opioid use dependence to opioid uh, overdose. So I think that that's a, that's a really important point to keep in mind ultimately. Yes, let me do, uh, thank you very much. And to conclude this session that we need to learn this topic much better, and let me to uh, appreciate your participation and to, th to uh, have some uh, appreciation uh, to Aiton from far, far from here. Uh, Aiton, we are here. Hello. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for being with us. And uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, I suppose this is the last uh, scientific uh, presentation uh, on this conference. Thank you. And uh, thank uh, you see you on the conference.